All right, uh, we have a special guest from Utah State University Forestry Extension, Darren McAvoy. Uh, he's going to be up here. He'll tell you a little more about it, but he'll be up here next summer on sabbatical um, with UAF, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, pleased to have him here. He's going to give us a little talk on biochar. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Clay. Thanks, everybody. I'll just try and use this one. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, great. Thanks. Appreciate it. See, I'm an extension forester in Utah. I serve a statewide audience. I'm not much of a researcher. I'm much more of a practitioner. I've only been called a professor for about the last six years. I've always kind of been a staff guy. And uh, I'll use this opportunity to talk about biochar and more towards the end, do a, a more formal introduction of my background. Mm -hmm. Which one do I, I thought it was the, so you have to click first and then that should perfect thank you and so uh i chair the utah biomass resources group uh, i was asked by the forest service and the blm about 10 years ago to found and put together a, a biomass resources group and uh the our sort of tagline i like to say is trying to make value out of trash because we're we're dealing with this low value wood and some people even call it a liability wood because it's is its ability to cause fires and that sort of thing. So I want everybody to understand this is a long shot, trying to make value out of trash, not easy. Um, so I don't do anything without partners. I, I represent the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network that I'm there uh, on their leadership team for, for Utah. Department of Natural Resources, the Forest Service, the BLM is a really important funder for the projects that I do. And I've got a couple of private uh, industrial partners that I work with as well. And the goals of the, pro the program, uh, first off, is reduce hazardous fuels. Uh, another goal is to improve firefighter safety. And as I mentioned, trying to make value from trash. And uh, a little note on my background, uh, just to show that it, this fire stuff isn't uh, foreign to me. And in the 80s, I was on the Flathead Hotshot crew. I got to be a Yellowstone firefighter in 1988. Uh, that's my picture on the far right corner there. I think we were in uh, Oregon for that shot, and we were in the Siskiyou National Forest for the for the bigger bigger picture in the Kalmyopsis Wilderness. And of course, that was like 40 years ago. And part of the reason I wanted to show you that picture from the Flathead is that while I was on the Flathead, these piles got burned. I may have burned these piles. And my colleague Debbie Dumrose with the Rocky Mountain Research Station out of out of uh, Idaho. She likes to show this photo of the piles that got burned in the late 80s, and you can still see today in Google Maps the holes in the vegetation from where these piles got burned. I think we all know that not every pile results in this sort of soil damage. These were likely machine-packed piles and uh, driven over and highly compacted, and probably the soil was pretty dry when they were burned, and that causes this sort of damage. But I'm trying to present a new way of doing business in the woods. I don't think we'll ever replace pile burning. It's just too too cheap and too easy, but there's a lot of benefits from doing that. And I wanna share some of those with you today. And yeah, that's the whole goal is try, try to find an alternative to pile burning. I've been burning piles my whole career. I've burned thousands and thousands of piles. Like many of you in the fall, you race from pile to pile, just burn up as much as you can. And, and well, what a waste. Maybe there is a better way of doing things. And I want you to know I didn't just start off burning stuff in boxes. That's what I'm mostly going to be talking about today, kind of the low end, most accessible ver version of biochar production. But I started off with these more high tech approaches, and, and that's what led me down this road. And today is the story the, what I want to share with you is kind of the story of how I got there. And so I, we started off with this machine called a gasifier, a mobile gasifier. We called it the Dragon Wagon. It was pretty cool. We painted it up in this fancy van and drove around the state and did a uh, workshops and state fairs and it was a great way to get ourselves started um, but in the end it, uh, in fact I, I want to share that one of our biggest successes we had Utah's only wood-fired concert to my to, to, to my knowledge to date on Main Street in Beaver Utah we had the country rock band called the, the Muddy Boots Band we, we powered them with this machine so we put on a, a barrel of wood chips and it would run for about eight hours and my vision for it was that it would run by itself for about eight hours and a farmer or rancher who needed remote power for irrigation or something could just put on that barrel of wood walk away come back eight hours later and keep going but it took all the time and effort of this super qualified technician friend of mine to keep this thing running. So it turned out to be not that practical. And 
but it was a lot of fun and it got us started. It kind of got us off the, uh, the, the starting block. And while we were working on that machine, we got some help from this company in Salt Lake City called Amaron Energy. And in the back corner of their shop, you know, we're all focused on that gasifier over here. And in the back corner of their shop was this little device. And this is a rotary pyrolysis kiln. I knew nothing about this at the time. And, and so gasification is cooking the wood at a high temperature, over 800 degrees Celsius. And this is pyrolysis. All of this happens in a limited oxygen environment. And this is happening. Pyrolysis is be, more between 400 and 600 degrees Celsius, typically. And so, um, and this little machine was made for uh, oil shale and other things, but we converted it to wood chips. And it was bolted to the floor of this shop in, in, in Salt Lake City, right next to the Tesoro refinery. And, uh, and I said, oh, that's great, but we can't afford to bring wood into this machine in Salt Lake City. That's completely not practical. Let's put it, let's make it mobile. So we got a grant, some Forest Service and BLM money, and we put it in this blue box. All bio, biomass machines are in like hidden blue boxes. It's one of my friends likes to tease me about that. And that, so we put that machine in this storage container, we'll put wheels on it, made it a trailer. And here we are in Bingen, Washington in 2013. And, and the, the Department of Natural Resources there hosted a mobile pyrolysis cook-off that we drove up there and did a competition. We're right across the Columbia Gorge from Hood River. And it turned, lo and behold, we won the competition. Never saw that coming. And uh, we made the best biochar and the, the greatest production of oil and that sort of thing. And that kind of got us up and running. And, and that allowed us to get a bigger grant, a, a sun grant, for a half a million dollars to scale this up. And the, the former machine, the, the guts of the reactor is a seven inch diameter tube. It's about seven foot long. And here we have the guts of the new reactor. It's a 24 inch diameter tube, stainless steel. It's 15 foot long. And so we could process quite a bit more material, about 20 tons a day. So approaching a loaded log truck and chips every day. And here, uh, Again, it goes in another blue box, and uh, we drove this one around, and here we are in the Nevada desert uh, for a 40-day run, mostly working on pinion juniper. As I mentioned, the BLM funds a lot of my work, so I focus a lot on pinion juniper, but not strictly. We did, I think, 28 different kinds of feedstocks in this machine uh, from... Mostly wood, of course, that's my focus, but I've done Phragmites, this invasive swamp reed that's a big deal on the Great Salt Lake and kind of worldwide. We've done uh, auto fluff, the material after you recycle a, a, an automobile, you, you take off the, the steel and the rubber and you're left with all the interior and everything else. And a, a local company wanted us to try to process that and we did, and tires and uh, all kinds of crazy things. And wool and, and rack, uh, uh, rayon, which actually is a wood-based uh, fabric, and and companies from uh, oh we did a company from New York had us do wool and and uh, dacron and rayon. A company from Indiana had us do coffee leftovers, and so all kinds of crazy things. And, and uh, but it was really interesting. And but over time we realized that. Uh, uh, it was really expensive and really difficult. My biggest dream for this machine is that you're gonna get it up and running and I can take a great big shovel full of dirt and throw it in there, just like we have in every slash pile and we'll keep running. And it just wasn't that kind of robust. This machine still runs in Salt Lake City. Uh, a, a partner here I'll show in a minute is, is operating it today. But in about 2014, when the price of petroleum dropped from $100 a barrel to $30 a barrel, the price of our bio oil became negative. It became a liability. And some of my colleagues in New Mexico call all this slash that we deal with a liability wood because it is a liability on the landscape. We start and feed fires and threaten firefighter safety and, and things like that. So we had to start burning off the oil. In this photo, I'm showing you the incinerators that the company built at the end of the machine just to get rid of it because out in the middle of Nevada desert, you're not going to easily find an oil tanker that's willing to deal with these kinds of oils. And so I started thinking, this is crazy to put so much money into a machine where we're just focused on biochar. There must be more simple ways to do it than this, at this time, a million dollar machine. And another big thing, at that run in Nevada, we found that it costs more to chip the wood, to pre-process it, than it did to pyrolyze it. And that that itself was crazy too. It's like, 
we need a way to make biochar cheaply and easily that's more accessible to people. And then I was at a conference, uh, I went to the biochar conference that year and it was in Corvallis, Oregon in 2016 and met a colleague named Kelpy Wilson, who I still work with. I was working with all week last week. Um, and she showed me these simple little Oregon kilns. And honestly, I sat in the back of the conference room and I just kind of quietly rolling my eyes at the scale of this thing. Yeah, it's great for backyards, but she showed a picture of it being moved around with machinery and similar skid steers. And I was tied in with a group of uh, the Richfield district of the Fish Lake National Forest had a team of skid steers. I thought, oh, that, that'll fit great. And I brought this, I got this grant, brought these home and lost my contact on the Richfield district. So that really never came to be, but it was a really useful tool. And I still like these. I still travel with these quite a bit. It's a great learning tool and, and it's great for backyard access. These little metal kilns weigh about 200 pounds each. So a few people can move them around in the woods. And I have a fact sheet that fully explains how to use them, and how to build them. You can have them welded up. You know, it costs me $600 to buy them, but if you know a welder and, and have extra steel, it, 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 that's, that's the cost of it. So pretty, very accessible. And I, I really like that. But like I said, I really was interested in scaling this up. So after a couple of years, I was able to get this grant, a, a Utah Public Lands Initiative grant, and create this thing I'm calling Big Box Biochar. So I started with this kiln. I call this one the BB-16, Big Box, 16 foot long. It was, uh, on this day, it was six feet tall, and it is eight feet wide, weighed about 3,000 pounds. And we needed this great big excavator with a low boy, an operator, and scheduling headaches to, to run the thing. And, and really, I was looking for something a little bit more accessible to the typical farmer or rancher and logger in Utah. And so, and I'll, I'll mention that this is a single wall construction. All my, all my other kilns from this point forward will be double wall construction. I'll talk about that a little bit more. So backing up a step, uh, more of an introduction to biochar itself, make sure everybody's on the same page here. Um, it's a way to preserve the carbon in the wood. Um, it, it's durable when we put it in the soil it has a half-life approaching a thousand years. And it's a means of, uh, of adding carbon to the soil. We make it through pyrolysis, just like we did with that fancy machine that I showed you. This is technically not burning the wood deep inside of a log, deep inside of that kiln. It's thermal chemical decomposition. The heat is coming from burning the log, uh, logs around it and the outside of that log, but deep inside of a larger diameter log, that's where that limited oxygen environment is going on. And it's thermally decomposing the wood into, um, into a gas and an oil most of which get burned off in this process and, um, and it results in biochar. This is a, a shot from the Bear River Massacre site, uh, America's largest uh, loss of Native American lives, 450 souls early one uh, February morning in the late uh, 1800s. An overzealous army captain from Salt Lake City came up and invaded uh, this Shoshone camp there. And, and uh, uh, today I, I work for the tribe in trying to restore this, this property using biochar amongst other things. That was just uh, this year that that photo was, same as this photo. Um, so what it does, it, uh, it absorbs nutrients and water. It can be used to absorb unwanted things out of water sources. Uh, it changes the soil structure. A handful of this material has the surface area of a football field. So it's all about the nooks and crannies down there. And, and it makes a place for microbes to hide from predators and increases the microbial ecosystem within your soil. And it increases water holding capacity of soils. I live in the second driest state in the nation. So that seems like an important thing. And it's, it depends on the soil type. It's around 20,000 gallons per acre that will increase water holding capacity in soil. I like to talk about the a potential value chain of biochar. And right now there is no business model that accounts for all of these things. I think this might be a place for government help with this sort of thing, trying to get value. Of course, when we burn a pile, um, all that wood, all that waste goes up into the air. Here, we're reducing the, the, the waste and, and, and hazardous material. So at the same time, we're, we're uh, helping with firefighter safety. As I mentioned, it, increase, it absorbs nutrients and, and moisture. Um, we can use it as a livestock feed amendment. I have a colleague who focuses on sheep nutrition mostly. And I, you know, after department meetings, I said to him, hey Juan, 
biochar, biochar for a couple of years running. And finally I had some money, had some time and we fed it to sheep over the course of the summer. And we saw, and this is published research that uh, we put out that a 14% weight gain in animals and, and lambs that had available in their diet. So it's got value there. And it, it, this ties back, you know, when I was on that hotshot crew and one winter I went to Asia for the, for the winter and my doctor says, take these charcoal tablets with you. If your stomach gets stodgy, you can take the tablets it will absorb those toxins and you'll pass them. My stomach never got stodgy. I never had to do that. But so this is an ancient remedy. There's nothing new about that. Um, it tends to increase long-term soil productivity and uh, it sequesters carbon. As far as I can see, I don't know of any other way you can, you can teach people on the farm, on the logging job, on the ranch, how to durably sequester carbon. Put this in the soil, it lasts for hundreds of years. And so this is the most accessible means of climate change mitigation that I'm aware of in the woods besides just growing trees. And it can be characterized. It's just not an empty black box. There's a company in California and, and several others around the country that are uh, authorized to do a US biochar initiative or international biochar initiative uh, approved method for characterizing the char. And there's a lot of these numbers I don't pay much attention to. When we're feeding it to sheep, I wanted to know, is there arsenic and things like that? But the number that I really pay, pay attention to is uh, the percent carbon. Yeah, and it's uh, 86%. And I was just really surprised at this. I, I kind of was telling people these, these simple kilns make a crude biochar. And some of my earlier samples were only 60%. I was under the impression needed one of those really high-end machines to make a higher quality char. And that tends to be around 90% for a higher quality biochar. And we're making a, a very high quality biochar for a lot less a lot less input than that. And uh, there's some other numbers there, but I won't belabor that point. Um, this is John Webster of the company Go Biochar in Salt Lake City is also now the, the communications chair for the US Biochar Initiative. And I just show this to, and, and he's lighting one of my big box kilns. I just believe that there's room in the market for all these different technologies. We can make sophisticated biochars with the machine that I showed you that he runs today that are precise, perhaps a golf course or uh, some nursery manager wants a biochar to deal with the problem in their soil. And that's ideally the way that it's done. We call these designer biochars, but the market isn't fully developed for that yet. But there's room for the high end and the low end in these markets. And this is my BB-12, the first one that I built. Now that I think there's a couple, uh, there's about a dozen of them around the country. Um, and this one is 12 foot by six foot by four foot high. I learned a lot when I built that first one, a lot of things that I did wrong. First off, it was six foot high. You couldn't see into the thing, had a ladder, climb the hill to see into the thing, which made it a lot harder to operate. I really wanted to get it down to 2000 pounds. I towed this down by two or three hours away to, to Willa, Utah last week and back and with my Tacoma and a simple little trailer. Uh, we can operate this with a mini excavator. So anybody can rent those from the local rental shop and don't need an operator, don't need a low boy, don't need all that scheduling headache. Um, it's got double wall construction, as you can see. Uh, we're looking down into the gap there, an inch or so wide gap, and that makes for more even heating inside of the kiln, which makes for better biochar production. And it, uh, it protects the operators and the equipment outside of the kiln from the extreme heat. We measured this uh, the other day, and uh, it was 928 degrees Celsius inside, deep inside the kiln. Um, so yeah, these are the BB-12s. This is mostly what I work with these days. Um, and I want to go through the whole method with you. So we just start by more or less randomly or haphazardly filling the kiln. It doesn't have to be any special order of, of material, although we like to often, if it's wet material, it works it definitely works better to have dry material, but we can do this with wet material, especially smaller diameter wet material. Um, but dry material, I go up to 30 inch diameter logs so far without any problems at all. Um, if it's wet, we might top dress it with some finer fuels to just to increase the ability to ignite it. Just light it with a drip torch. Um, and, um, and yeah, just top, and it's important to top light it. 
I lost a lot of sleep when I got this grant. Am I going to burn up excavators? I don't really have an account to pay for somebody's excavator. I want to piss off some operator. Um, and, and I lost it. I thought I was going to have to like devise a stirring stick for that. All, all that was not, it was just something to lose sleep over. Not, yeah. And just, it turned out to be no problems at all. And I, I've just been really shocked at how durable excavators are. And, and, you know, I've had great, great operators and they're willing to jump out every few minutes and put their hand in the boom and make sure you touch the hoses. You know, these are pressurized hoses and uh, with uh, hydraulic fluid in them right next to fire. So imagine the trouble if, if one of those blew open and, and the, the safety issues. But so to date, you know, knock on wood, no, no problems. Um, and an important part of this process is the flame cap. And you're looking right through what we call the flame cap right now. As soon as you get it started, this flame, flame cap establishes itself and it consumes all the combustibles as they come up through the kiln. I've had uh, you know, air quality people come and measure this sort of thing. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but uh, yeah, lots of examples of, you know, we're looking at the mountainside on the other side completely clearly. So you see very little emissions coming out of these. And then a really important part of the process when the kiln is about full, we look for that moment where it switches from flaming combustion to glowing combustion. You all know that moment you're sitting around the campfire late at night, kind of falling asleep and you can almost hear a poof in the fire, right? And it, and it goes from flaming, it's just glowing coals. Then you have the biochar if you, quench it. So on this, these kilns, we put 300 gallons of water. So it's an important thing to have, you know, a water tender. I tend to do this a lot with Division of Forestry, Fire and State Lands, or the, the Forest Service. And, you know, they're always willing to bring tankers and trucks and water tenders and that sort of thing. If not, I can just pump out of the nearby creek and that, that's all worked just fine. So we're looking for that moment when the, uh, the uh, when the kiln is full of, of these coals and it switches to glowing combustion. And uh, from an operational standpoint, this tends to happen twice a day. I'll start in the morning, load up a batch. You keep loading the kiln, adding wood to the kiln, tending it like a campfire. If you put too much wood on your campfire, you're gonna smother it. If you don't put enough on, it's gonna go out. So it's a little bit of an art just like that. And then, um, and, and for us, the practicality of it, tend to get one in the morning before lunch, we'll quench, dump, take lunch, start again. At the end of shift, we'll be able to do this again. And so the size of this is a 10 yard um, kiln that I've built. And so it's about 20 yards of, of biochar, cubic yards each day that we produce with this. Tipping is perhaps the trickiest part of the thing, especially when you have a smaller excavator and not the most uh, qualified uh, operator sometimes. Most of them have been really good, but uh, it's just a little bit awkward. And I'm still, this is an iterative process. Every time I run it, I learn a little bit something new and make modif modifications to the kilns as much as I can afford to. And so I'm trying to think of ways to tip the kiln a little bit easier and I'm working with colleagues. I've got people kind of all over the country have built these kilns and I kind of count them as my partners now and I can count on them to, they're, they're making these modifications that I consider. I don't make the modifications because I'm kind of suspect to how they're gonna turn out, but uh, I got a lot of people taking that risk for me. So I'll, I'll be visiting as part of my sabbatical next year, folks around the country who are making kilns like this and in different ways and different materials and, and see what works for them and what doesn't. Do you wanna put on roll off dumpster wheels? Ah, that's great, but these are on skids so I can just skid them around the woods easily, you know, from even while they're burning, it's the funnest part is while they're burning, I tie them up to my Tacoma and pull it up to the next pile when we finish that one. Awesome, driving around with a burning kiln right behind your truck. It's a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, tipping is one of the trickier parts of it. Of course, fire line safety. Safety is super important when you're doing this. I feel a little bit at risk. I'm a university employee and burning stuff in the woods all the time. It could could go sideways. You never know. Um, I've done this in red flag warnings in the middle of June and, and really heavy fuels in July. I've done it in every month of the year so far in and around Utah. Um, uh, some of the things I, I recommend that people always dig a fire line around it. When you put material in, you're always going to be a little bit sloppy. And, and most of the smoke that you'll see coming out of them are just branches that were loaded up on top and dropped down to the ground or just burning around it. So we have a little fire line around it for that reason. Embers tend not to come out of these kilns, but there are exceptions. I was burning on that Bear River Massacre site um, on that red flag day in June a couple of years ago. I was like super nervous about it and 
But as all oh, my colleagues tell me, embers never come out of these kilns. And then I'm walking by this cow pie that's smoking. It's like, oh man, that could go bad. You know, the smoking cow pie that, that, that really tells a lot about a project. But, and I think that wasn't really a wind driven thing. That was more a mechanical thing. We dropped a big log on there and, and the ember bounced out of there. So you got to watch out for that. Pay attention. Always have a fully charged hose available. Like it's just common sense when you're dealing with fire and then confirming that the fire is out. If you, you haven't been a firefighter, you may not know what cold trailing is. It just uh, when I was assigned to fire up on top of a mountain with a quarter acre and the forest service said, you don't leave until that's out. I, I would just touch eventually every square inch of that with my bare hands. And if it was cool to the touch, the fire is out. Same thing here. At the end of the day, take the pile. Don't just stuff your bare hand into a hot pile. Use some common stance. Start with the, you know, gloved hand and then go to the back of the hand, but eventually be able to touch every square inch of that pile. Cool to the touch and you sleep well that night. Until that happens, I, I've got a stack of stories of, uh, you know, given early on with the fancy machine, giving a guy a bucket of biochar and his pickup. And we hear later he's driving down the road home and all of a sudden he looks in the back and he's got flames coming out of the back of his truck. So don't let that happen to you. Don't don't be me. <laughs> um, and so obviously this is way more expensive and way more labor intensive than burning piles. We'll probably never completely replace burning piles, but here we're doing it concurrently with burning piles. So it doesn't have to be exclusive of that. Um, and when you burn a pot, you know, wood grows, it takes carbon out of the air. And uh, if you let that wood rot, then all that carbon goes back into the air. If you burn that pile, just openly, all that carbon goes back into the air. With this method, a third to a half of that carbon is preserved with that thousand year half-life. So this starts to make sense, I like to say on the edges, in stream management zones where we can't, at least in Utah, we can't burn piles. Utah is such a small state. I wrote the best management practices in Utah. We just, you know, you talk about being underfunded and not having enough people here in, in Alaska. And I can, I can see that and experience it, but we have maybe to a different scale, the same sort of experience in Utah. There's just not very many foresters and we just don't, there's not many people with the kind of skills that you have in this room in, in Utah. And so this way is an, perhaps a new way of doing business that in this way, we can preserve that carbon. At least a third to a half of that original carbon is preserved for hundreds of years in the soil. The kilns are stackable. They're like uh, little Russian dolls. Uh, here I have a BB-16 below, a BB-12 going inside of it. In this inset photo, I have some of the Oregon kilns sitting inside of that. So a contractor can show up to a site with one trailer, have a stack of kilns and, and sort of modify that for each uh, property that he's on. That's appropriate. So uh, I was fortunate to have our smoke management uh, individual, Paul Corrigan, come. He's a Forest Service employee and a statewide smoke coordinator, I, I think all states have. And, and uh, he set up this air quality monitoring device right next to my kiln and uh, saw no difference in it between this this monitoring device and one 10 miles away. So that was a good step. And then this last week in Tooele, Utah, I hosted three different kilns. I'll show you the different kinds here in a minute. And I had the fire lab. I was lucky to work with Deb Dumrose from the Rocky Mountain Research Station. And uh, we had the fire lab come down from Missoula, their emissions testing team, to do the emissions testing in all three of these kilns. And at this point, we had, these are treated just like pile burning. So we have to jump through the same hoops that we have to. In Utah, they only give us a three-day warning and whether we can burn piles or not. That's really challenging for me because all of my projects, it's all about demonstration as an extension person. So I, I like to announce them 30 days in advance. So trying to get by these rules is a little bit challenging, but we're working on it. To date, uh, BB-12 kilns have been built or, or are currently being built in, in Moab, uh, Utah. Uh, the BLM has their own kiln there. I got to go to Dillon, Montana here a couple of months ago or in the fall and train them on their first BB-12. Um, people, uh, a guy in Longmont, Colorado has already built one. Harvard University has actually built one. It's one of the, my favorite things about the sabbatical proposal thing. I, I, part of it, I didn't know I got sabbatical until January and the, the paperwork was due two weeks later. And so I just 
pulled some stuff out of my, yeah, you know. And uh, one of the things I said I would do, oh, I would give a presentation at Harvard. And it turns out they have, they built one of my BB-12s and I didn't tell them in the proposal, I'll probably be giving that presentation in the back of one of the greenhouses, just to the guys who trim trees, but hey, it's still a presentation at Harvard, you know, we're working that. Um, there's a farmer in Corning, New York, who's has made some really cool modifications. I mentioned the, the roll off wheels. I wanna see how those work. He also built a, a, an end door, full end door that would open so he doesn't have to tip it. He can just pull the material out with a small uh, tractor. My concern about that is it's gonna be hard to, to uh, seal that door for the quenching process. I'm not sure how that part's gonna work. And I would think those hinges would get buggered up with the heat, but I'm looking forward to go visiting him in the fall to, to find out what, what that is. And these other states and provinces, they're, they're building these kilns as well. And I have plans available. I'm working on a, a paper or the Journal of Video Experiments, which I had never heard of a few months ago. Uh, and it's usually, you know, oh, this is how we titrate this and that. It's like, it's lab stuff. So they're a little out of place. They're not used to having us work it in the woods. And But uh, we'll have a full video methods paper per, uh, published, uh, hopefully, in a few months on this that will include plans on these BB-12 so people can build them anywhere. They're costing about $10,000 for me to have built. But this Corning, New York individual Jewel. He had these Amish dumpster builders in the neighborhood build one for half price. So yeah, I'm still working on that. This is in Arizona about a year ago. I was invited to give a, a kiln demonstration there and these small kilns with my extension partner, Chris Jones, down there. And so I want to just share you, with you some of the scales of production. Some of these kilns can get uh, quite small. These are the typical ones. It's called an Oregon kiln. It's five foot by five foot on top and about 200 pounds. One of the smallest scales is uh, this is a rancher in Utah and I've done big box biochar on his property, but he's got this cool kind of tiny scale where he bought these leftover food service containers and he fills them with wood chips each night and he puts them in the bottom of his wood stove and has a typical wood stove fire and wakes up to fresh biochar every morning. He likes that. And uh, a friend did this and is doing it in his backyard just from a typical Lowe's or Home Depot fire pit. It's another super small scale approach. Um, I had these built specially so they'd slip in the back of my Tacoma and I could, like, this is in Longmont, Colorado in December and I hate driving across I-80 across winter and with a trailer. Uh, I-80 is a terrible enough road without, without that. So I, I like to have these and even better yet, these will fit perfectly into the back of a 16 foot raft. So river trips are coming up. Uh, there's all these invasive uh, Russian olive and, and tamarisk and, and Utah rivers. It's on, on BLM property. So planning on working with BLM and others to, to get rid of it using these kilns. And it doesn't have to be some you know, special kiln. When I first went into this, especially with the big box pro, uh, program, I proposed that we would repurpose materials. This is, you know, just a, a cattle watering trough. And I did a workshop and it worked great. This is in Boulder, Utah, a few years ago. But I realized after this workshop that, you know, all this repurposed material, it's got galvanized on it and paint on it. And I've always, you know, I'm an extension guy. I've got 30 to 50 to 70 people standing around one of these kilns every time. And I don't want them exposed or myself or anybody exposed to this sort of uh, uh, pollution. If I was on the back 40 and, you know, and just working by myself, I think that might fly, but it, it doesn't work for me. So I've gone for all uh, original steel. Um, this one uh, was one of the ones that got uh, tested last week in Utah. Our colleague from Cape Junction, Oregon, Kelpie Wilson with Wilson Biochar, brought her ring of fire kilns. So these are these stand out. There's no floor on them, which is good and bad. That uh, makes it a lot lighter. It doesn't protect the soils quite as well. Um, but uh, it's a double wall kiln. We actually built it wrong. We were supposed to when we assembled it. Yeah, that. that the wall, the outside wall is supposed to go up a little higher, but uh, the beauty of these is that they unbolt and they can fit in the back of a Subaru. So you don't need to have any equipment, trailer, pickup, any of that. This is much more accessible to people with none of that sort of infrastructure. 
and you can have multiple kilns running simultaneously. This is my sort of next step at home. I sort of scaled it up to this size of kiln, and I, and I learned a new word last week that I just love scaling it out. So instead of up and bigger, bigger kilns, just more and more kilns. So the idea I've talked with the district ranger of the Heber Camas district on the, you went to Wasatch Cache National Forest, local to us. And, and uh, he's, he asked me, can we have like four of these kilns at each uh, gravel pit every 10 miles along the Mirror Lake Highway and a few other popular roads in, in that part of Utah and a full-time excavator and, and water truck sitting there and all the thinning material that they got coming out. Everything sits seven inches and less just goes directly into the kilns and we're bringing in wood and bringing out char all day long. So I'm hoping that that's going to happen in the future. Um, I work with the Payette National Forest, Deb Dumrose and others on this project trying to learn how to make biochar without any kilns. So we call this conservation burning. Typically when we burn a pile, we walk up to the bottom of it, we light it from the bottom. So we get, you know, heating and better consumption all the way through. And so in this method, we, we top light the pile. And then at the end, before it is completely extinguished, we might quench to preserve some of that carbon. And it pr produces a, a, a small fraction of what the kilns will produce, but it's a small fraction of the work and input that is required. And here we're, do we're doing it in such a way where we're taking the biggest logs that weren't utilized, we're creating a deck of those logs, and we're putting the pile on top of that to protect the, the soil from any further heating and damage. And then we're left with these large diameter coarse woody debris sections that, that can be just spread back out into the forest and we're protecting the soil at the same time. Utah has a history of charcoal production. I like to point out to my local crowd that this is nothing new and crazy. I um, mean, these are uh, historic kilns that have been, it's a his, historic site and they've been you know, remodeled or refurbished for, for tourists to come and look at. This was at an SAF meeting in, in uh, Evanston uh, about 10 years ago. And, uh, and this was for the charcoal production industry. And charcoal and biochar, are pretty much the same thing. If I was focusing on making charcoal, I might, quench it a little bit sooner while some of those volatiles were still on the wood and with, but they're more or less the same thing. And so this is nothing new in Utah or around my part of the West. And I thought I'd like to share this because I got to give a talk uh, about this topic in Brazil at the International Union of Forest Research Organizations a few years ago. And uh, there, my colleague and I, Hansu Pan, found out about these kilns that they have all over Brazil. And Han, he's a forest operations guy. I would never try to do this, but I'm just on the back of a napkin at the conference. We kind of figured it out with how much wood we're working with a local professor. How much wood did all of Brazil put in these kinds of kilns last year? And then we compared that number to the amount of hazardous fuels in various states in the United States. So we came to find out in one year, Brazil with these kilns consumed more biomass, what we might call hazardous fuels then sits in the entire state of California and the entire state of Arizona right now in one year. And so that may not be a practical thing, but I think it is practical for showing people that, yes, we, it is possible to get a handle on these problems. We call these wicked problems and, and that we're never, you know, they're intractable. We're never going to get by them. But I think this example sort of shows otherwise. I have a series of fact sheets on this, on how to build the kilns and how to operate them, as I mentioned. And I wanna talk a little bit about applications now. Um, I'm not an apply, uh, application of bio, I'm an applied guy, not an applications of biochar guy so much. It, it's not my specialty, I'm more about the production of it, but I wanna share this with you. Most of the time it, it gets spread out in the woods like we did here. Often we're producing this on the landing, the most impacted part of a logging job and that has the most compaction. And that's what needs the char most. And you have the excavator sitting there so it can spread the char pretty easily for it. We've tested it uh, to save uh, water under irrigation pivots. The goal here was to put 25% uh, less water on this alfalfa and on corn fields under irrigation pivots on three farms in Utah. We didn't have the best results with this. I, and we're not currently really recommending this for broad scale agriculture. It's better for higher quality or uh, higher value products like berries, Fruit trees is a little more challenging just because we, it takes so long to prove the value on fruit trees. Hard to get a 15 year grant for that sort of thing. We think it's got value there. 
This is uh, Southern Idaho, the Curlew National Grassland, not very far, a couple of hours from where I live. It turns out it's critical monarch butterfly breeding habitat. Who knew? Sagebrush in Southern Idaho is useful for that. And so these are Forest Service employees I'm working with, the soil scientist, Dave Barr there, uh, to, uh, we're trying to grow better uh, milkweed and, and pollinators for, for the butterflies there using biochar application. 14% um, increase in, 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 in sheep, as I meant, uh, weight, weight gain in sheep published in the Journal of Animal Science Feed Technology. I'm sure you all subscribe to that one. Um, I just wanted to mention sort of casually, I don't recommend people put raw biochar on their gardens or agricultural lands because it's an empty sponge. It'll absorb the nitrogen and rob it from your tomato plants in the short term. So we always recommend that you inoculate it or charge it first. Here's a garden I had in my backyard, a brand new one last year. Just put a garbage sack full of char and a few bags of composted cow manure on it. Mix it up for a couple of weeks. We had the best tomatoes we've ever had. A um, little bit of my professional history, just quickly. Um, I, I went to Colorado State University. That's the only picture that exists of me studying in the whole world, because I think it's the only, only time I actually did study. Um, but uh, this is my intro to wildland fire textbook. This is all kind of tie into this story and it's written by Stephen Pine. Does everybody know who Stephen Pine is? Arguably the world's foremost fire historian. And uh, it, so I thought that I didn't I didn't know, think anything about it at the time. It was just a textbook and, and mentioned it. So I started working on the, the fire line in about 1983. I was on a cruise out of Colorado, Fort Collins. When I worked there, the Larimer Yellow Jackets, I think they were called. Um, and then I worked on the Kootenai National Forest on the Yak District for a period of time, did a little bit of fire and then uh, onto the Hotshot Crew and then after that, in, in the 1990s, I was on work for Inland Forest Management out of Sandpoint, Idaho, as a consulting forester, and ran their prescribed burn program. And, and uh, yeah, some of that background. That's back when I had color in my hair. And uh, I got to produce this video as uh, my master's thesis project at Utah State University. Went to every national park in the, in the country that has a fire program. It's a video called The Missing Fires. And one of the Greatest things about producing that video is I got to go to Stephen Pine's house and interview him on his front porch. I, that was just a, a great honor for me. And one of the things he said to me, it didn't make it into the video, but it sticks with me to this day is he said, one of the problems is we've put fire in a box. It's in our stove, it's in our oven, it's, it's in our furnace, and we don't see it. We've lost our connection with it. I just find it incredibly ironic that he gave me this piece of wisdom. And what do I do now? My whole career is trying to put fire in the box. Go figure. And so about my last slide, oh, I, I'm sorry, my photo did not make it into here, but I, I was trying to find a photo of Bob Wheeler. Uh, Bob Wheeler is, was the extension forester back, back uh, 20 years ago, and he hosted you know, my first trip to Alaska, or I guess it was my second trip. This is my fourth trip today, thanks to Deshanna York. Um, but he hosted a climate change tour here in about 2004. And not many people in the Western US were talking about climate, especially foresters, openly talking about climate change. And it was all focused on that. And, and I'm just, I was just really appreciative uh, for Bob hosting that. It was, it was a great time. This is my contact information. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. That was fascinating. I really appreciated it. Thank you. Um, I know you said it wasn't really your your wheelhouse when it did. I'm just curious. Um, how does anyone keep track of how the biochar biochar affects soil amendment, like pH levels and, and everything? Is that a yeah. factor? It is. It absolutely is. Um, that Bear River Massacre site that I showed, uh, we made biochar from Russian olive there, and it's a pH of 9.3. That is a factor. It's a real problem. But if we charge it first, that will moderate the pH to, to a more acceptable level. So mixing it with compost, charging it first. Yep, that's how you deal with that. Good question. So they found the rats, how much did they make? Uh, they, the kilns that go into a 16 foot raft weigh about 200 pounds, which is no problem for a 16 foot raft. That's about 
You know what Dutch oven is? That's a big deal in Utah. Okay, no, I don't know, it's a handful of Dutch ovens. No problem. <laughs> Other questions? Online. Nope. You said there was. It's not not economic to do to do this, but um, is there a point, a price point where it would be? At this point, it's really we have yet to establish markets. Especially, if, I mean, we've hardly got markets for biochar. Period. That's when you know we kind of kid each other at the, these conferences. Oh, you find a market yet? You find, no, I haven't found one yet. And, and you know, and, and there are some markets, but they're limited. And, and there are some producers who are, there's a guy in Colorado, uh, James Gaspard is, is very successful at it uh, as a guy in the Midwest. Rowdy Yates is very successful at it. He's actually in Laramie now. Um, so people are making money at it. The average price nationally right now is $250 a cubic yard of biochar, but there's yet to be a market developed for this sort of lower end in woods produced biochar. So it depends on how the future, yeah, I don't, we're hoping for that. I'm hoping for some sort of business model that recognizes these different value stations, the potential value chain that I mentioned. If, if, if perhaps with government assistance or something, we can come up with that sort of package, then it'll start to make a lot more sense. Did I answer your question? It's not, uh, no, 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 it's just, it's just, uh, it's just that it's a, it, it does answer the question about it, but it's interesting to see that the, there's a higher end market. And if you can market it in a local area, it works. But for a broadcast area, kind of what you're talking about and what we'd have to deal with up here, you know, right? Uh, it, it's obviously not there yet. It's and marginal. Wouldn't, wouldn't know how to use it anyway. And then how, how are we going to broadcast it everywhere? Who would be most interested in you in Alaska, perhaps, would be your cannabis farms. It's a big deal in California and in Colorado. It's, it's so it's, it's so what we call it, probably like a, a mom and pop operation at, at this point, and not not really yeah. commercial. It's not production ag yet. Um, have you been in touch with the folks in Homer? I know Judy Reese brought this up like ten years ago to the All Hands All Hands group, and um, we we didn't really know how to proceed with it, but I know there's people in Homer who are doing it and probably contributing it to the soils in their high tunnels and stuff. I'm just guessing. I Thank you. And, you know, I should say, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, I mean, my purpose for giving this presentation today really is to create these partnerships. I'll be up here next summer. I'll be based out of uh, the Matanuska Experiment Farm and Extension Station. And I'm looking for partners who are interested. I could come and do workshops with any of the sizes of kilns that, that you've seen. The biggest challenge, perhaps, for the big box kiln would be find funding to build one uh, that, that I can move around up here. Um, but other than that, yeah, I'd love to come and give some workshops or just some talks or whatever people are interested in. And I do, you know, I work in cross laminated timber and general fire and lots of other forestry topics, but this is kind of my, my little baby. Uh, one of the many hats I wear is with the uh, Farm Bureau and the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. And in Homer, uh, we did have somebody named Art from the Extension Service that came and did a number of demonstrations. And there was a small, which took off from um, Art. Art Nash? Art Nash. And and uh, and it's it's somewhat thriving. It's very small in scale, yeah. Yeah. and uh, there was somebody that actually went and made a larger one oh. that uh, probably would benefit from some of your. Oh, but but great. it's uh, or, or or you can be like me, and I go to the local homecoming football game right after the homecoming parade. Three days later, after it rains. And then the school is more than willing to have me go there with a shovel and a broom and a magnet and pick up all the char that's on that parking lot. <laughs> They've already burned it for me, so it works out well. I could be like you. <laughs> I think I already am like you. <laughs> I guess I have uh, two things. Um, when you come up here, the Chugach National Forest just bought an incinerator because they can't chip because the chips get too deep and they can't burn piles anymore because it's a hard time for them to do it. It's a hard um, time everywhere. So they, I think they spent like over a hundred thousand bucks on a burn box to yeah, right. those seems like way cheaper and you get something cool. But 
Um, I grow peonies and there's a number of peony farmers in the state and mm -hmm. there's a cut flower mm -hmm. and people always talk about biochar mm -hmm. and I've never seen anything on how to use it as an amendment. This is the first time I've ever heard of charging. Um, the only study I've ever seen on biochar and peonies was Washington State University Extension and the peonies they planted in biochar did worse than the ones they didn't. And so everyone talks about it as an amendment, but like every other soil amendment, I can go look up a table from Cooperative Extension on how to use it appropriately. And I've never seen that information on biochar. It would be really handy if someone has something like that because- Working on that. Uh, I've, I've never seen it. Right, it hardly exists. Uh, Kristen Tripp with the ARS out of Corvallis, Oregon, uh, developed a thing she calls the biochar atlas for the Northwest. And it's kind of what you're talking about. Everybody who makes and applies biochar can submit a, a paper to this or a sheet uh, describing how they made the biochar, how they used it. So other users can 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 learn from that. And she just got $900,000 to make that a, a national thing. So that, to my knowledge, that's, that's the most advanced program in, in reference to what you're talking about. Good, good point. Yeah, it's a challenge. Kind of a related question. I was just curious, you know, where you're burning these, you know, these slash piles in the woods and you're dumping the biochar out on the landings there or whatever. Yeah. Are you, I was just curious, are you mixing it in? Is the excavator mixing it in or are you getting, you know, if you just spread it out on top, I would think you'd have that issue where nothing would grow on it because it's not charged or whatever. Right. Right. And so uh, I'm just wondering how they're doing that. And if things are growing on, on these landings after they, I don't have out. any research to, point to that way. I do have a lot of research to point to that it decreases the compaction of soils when you add it to soil. So it's going to help the landings from that perspective. Um, we're not charging it when we put it in the forest soils. We're not worried about, we tend not, you know, it's such a long-term thing. It's going to sort of charge itself over a period of time, which is acceptable, I think, in a forest setting, not so much in your tomato garden. So um, I, 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 they're not looking to like seed those and get them growing trees or grass again, I guess, in right some away. Cases, I'm yeah. sure that they are, you know, if it's it's not a production logging job, it's mom and pa that don't expect to be back in there in production and for yeah. decades, then perhaps yes. All right. I was just curious if it was like helping maybe those areas maybe revegetate quicker than they would if you were burning piles. I don't really know. Uh, I... I can speak to it indirectly. I mean, first off, there's 30,000 biochar publications, peer-reviewed articles right now available in the press. So I can't really keep up. I'm not doing a very good job of keeping up with all this. So I don't really know, but I've seen examples that point me towards the conclusion that yes, it is helping. Yeah. That's interesting stuff. Thanks for your interest. Appreciate it. <laughs>